and Indrani from the Center for Women's Learning and Studies, and we have Nitya Rao uh, and uh, Praveena Kaurdar. So just uh, introduce briefly each of the speakers. Uh, Nita is a faculty and professor, as well as the acting director of CWDS. And she has a very long standing uh, work uh, in uh, uh, gender and migration and on labor issues, uh, particularly with a focus on uh, domestic workers. Indrani, again, uh, her work has been mostly on gender and labor and migration issues. And she also has ground level experience in organizing women uh, in the women's movement and working for uh, workers' rights. Uh, uh, Nitya Rao, she is a professor uh, of gender uh, and is uh, working at the University of East Anglia. And um, uh, in her um, uh, vast experience, it's been mostly on land uh, on agrarian uh, relations, on migration, uh, and livelihoods. And all her, uh, all these themes, she has focused uh, on gender issues specifically. And she has written uh, 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 a couple of books, uh, of which uh, uh, one of the books uh, that a lot of people have cited is Good Women Don't Inherit Land. And uh, Praveena Kodot, she's a professor at the Center for Development Studies, uh, Trivandrum. And her experience is mostly uh, working on international migration, uh, particularly of women's migration to Gulf countries, uh, focusing on uh, nurses and domestic workers. And uh, her latest book is on immigration of women domestic workers from uh, Kerala. And she has uh, looked at the uh, role of you know, state policy and the politics of the movement. And our moderator for this session is uh, Professor Indu Agnihotri, who has been our former director. And uh, she, again, is an activist, come researcher. Uh, uh, and she began her career as a faculty at the Delhi University. And she would be moderating uh, this uh, uh, session. So over to you, Hindu. OK. Abhinav Thank you. I'm saying that she can't hear. Who's there? Who can't hear? I can hear. Okay, I've just unmuted myself. Okay. Uh, so, thank you, Dimple. We're very sorry we're running uh, late already before we've started. Um, Indu, can you first ask people to mute their mics? That's what I was just background going to conversation. Do. Yeah, that's what I was going to do. Dimple uh, was to request all the participants. Yeah, I think I uh, in between did not say their that. Mics. Please mute their mics and the panelists. Please, everybody, mute the mics. And the panelists may also mute their mics when they are not uh, so that will facilitate because we're already sort of having a lot of disturbance in the um, technology. Uh, well, with uh, despite the late start, what I would say is that uh, we're very happy to have this uh, webinar today. Uh, migration is an issue with which the Center for Women's Development Studies has engaged over long, a uh, very long time. In fact, it's C CWDS's 40th year. And uh, we can uh, say that for almost as long as we have existed in some ways as uh, uh, research is engaged uh, directly on in the field on um, in terms of this action research program also with issues of migration which are closely linked to livelihood and uh, also that uh, the link between migration livelihood and the rural india uh, as far as india is concerned is extremely uh, close it's continuous uh, the nature of that relationship may change, the scenario may change, as for instance, those of us who have uh, seen that how during the pandemic, the issue of migrants, migrant workers has played out in a very, very visible sense. Even so, what we find is that women, uh, although domestic workers came into this picture in some more clear terms, but otherwise women, women's work, Come, I want to migration, uh, please uh, 
please mute your mics of those who are participating in this webinar please mute your mics i'm repeating this uh, so what we find is that uh, uh, the aspect of women's migration particularly women's migration related to work and labor continues to be uh, an aspect which is not necessarily probed and even what uh, issues are emerging from the data are not sufficiently analyzed. Uh, that is one aspect. The, there's another aspect which we find is related to the nitty gritty of migration, the modes, the patterns, the routes uh, that uh, migration, migrants tend to follow, the routes that develop, the um, uh, modes and, uh, of recruitment of migrants, uh, also the uh, forms in terms of the, whether it's family based or single migrants, group based, there are, uh, it's a very, very, very rich typology, which uh, the CWDS team, which started its work on migration in more recent years, um, uh, in about more than a decade ago, found that uh, the issue of typologies uh, was uh, uh, very critical to understanding particularly short-term seasonal circular migration. Uh, the other aspect that we always found was that, uh, you know, in popular discourse, even in the cultural uh, portrayal of issues of migrants, there are uh, sort of certain common themes and strands which run. For instance, there's a sense of nostalgia. There's a sense of uh, going back uh, uh, to the roots. There's also a sense of a search for permanence. And we found that all these were in a flux because the nature of the rural economy, the nature of the urban economy, the links between the rural and the urban, and the patterns of growth that are emerging uh, in even periods of high growth, they were challenging in terms of all these aspects. Uh, there is a lot to say on this, but I'm sure the Indu, you can't be heard. Yeah, I've just... Uh... Now, again, silent. So... Indu, unmute yourself. Indu, you keep muting yourself. Yes, now speak. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, uh, well, I think there are several issues which this very uh, rich uh, experience uh, that our panelists bring to this discussion, both in terms of internal migration as well as international migration. Uh, the, uh, another aspect that we find has always been there with migrants and the discourse on migrants is with regard to the change, the autonomy, the freedom, the sense of uh, uh, breaking from the rigidities of rural society, the, uh, fr from a kind of social historical past uh, sort of uh, remains. And in, uh, at the international level, from the histories of colonial migration, there has been a tendency to project migration as a form of great escape, as it was called. And including in India, we would find that there is an understanding that maybe migration makes you leave behind those rigidities, those hierarchies. And I think the studies, our own studies, point to different uh, trends, also complexities. It's very difficult to generalize on these aspects. We found that in the 10 to 15 years that we were studying migration over the last so many years, uh, things were changing so fast. So it's a volatile situation on the ground. The economy impacts women and women's uh, entry into migration patterns differently. So I would, uh, I'm not going to say much more right now because I think we have a very good panel and we should go directly. So I'd like to first request Nita. And um, uh, Nita, as you all know, has worked on these issues for a long time. There are data issues, there are methodological issues in terms of how data is analyzed, what kind of data we have, and the trends that emerge. So Nita, over to you. 
Yeah, I'll start. Actually, I have a PowerPoint presentation. I'll try and share it so that I can be brief also. It's been disabled. Oh, oh. Dimbul? Nita, continue because I think. Nita, you'll haven't come on to the full screen. Huh? You'll have not come on to the full screen. That's probably why you can't use your PowerPoint. Also. We can only see you on the side, not in the main. It says you can pin the video, but I'm say I'm told that the host has not uh, yes. enabled me to participate to share my screen. Dimble, can you uh, then give the? Uh, you are in the full screen, Nita. Now. I am in the full screen, but uh, yeah. I can't. No, it says you to share your PPT. You, uh, there's a box coming in, so I I suggest you proceed, Nita, or till you're trying to fix that, then Indrani should start. Then that no, no, I think I'll start. Yes. Mm -hmm. well, will you please put the presentation on? I've shared it with you. Anyway, uh, so let me start by talking about the official migration data. Uh, the official migration data relates primarily to population movements and not labor migration. So because of this, there are difficulties and a degree of fussiness uh, when you try and distinguish population movements from labor migration. So there are two uh, important uh, data sources on migration. One is the census. And uh, one is the census. You can go down, Dimbul, if you can. Just go down. Yeah, that's fine. So there are two uh, different sources, as I said, the, the census and the national sample survey. But the problem is that both these the sources do not have a single definition to identify migrants. Uh, the two major data agencies collect information uh, on migration use, using different criteria, though both are based on the change in place of residence to define migrants. According to census, an individual is classified as a migrant if the person has changed his or her place of residence in the past from one village or a town to another village or town. It, has a place, it also has a place of birth classification. On the other hand, NSS defines, NSSO defines migration on the basis of the last usual place of residence, uh, where the last usual place of residence is defined as a place where one has stayed continuously for a period of six months or more. If the present place of residence uh, of an individual is different from his usual place of residence, then the person is categorized as a migrant. The latest data that we have on migration is the census uh, 2011 data and, uh, and the 2007-8 NSS data. The census data on migration is always delayed, particularly this round. We had the first provisional round only in 2016. And even now, the RGI, the Registrar General of India, is set to release some data on migration, like the industrial distribution of the migrants. It is clear that it is, the, uh, it is, a, uh, it is actually much lower down on the data release schedule, and uh, the migration data is always coming uh, last in terms of uh, how it is tabulated and released. The NSS has undertaken three surveys, all of them in conjunction with its employment, unemployment survey. Dimble, please don't go down, I'll ask you. The NSS has undertaken three surveys, I said, uh, and mostly it, these are in conjunction with its employment and unemployment survey. The last migration survey, which is the 64th round, the first dedicated survey on migration was conducted in 2007-8 as part of the employment and unemployment schedule. After that, we, we don't have any data coming from National Sample Survey. Uh, there has been a major disagreement over of official migration estimates on account of its inability to recognize short-term and circulatory migration, which Indra Indu has just referred. There is an underestimation of short-term and cir circulatory migration, then that leads to underestimation of migration by women and other marginalized sections, such as of SC and ST. The, the NSS 55th round was the, was the first when NSS collected information on short-term migration and it covered all people who stayed away from the village or town for 60 days or more for employment or in search of employment. The NSS 64th round changed the definition and defines a person as a short-term migrant when that person is away from the village for a period of one to six months during the last year for employment or in search of employment. 
irrespective of the definition that has been used by NSS, it is only about 1% of the to total population uh, you know, who uh, came under the category of short-term migrants, which clearly shows the definitional weaknesses that exist in terms of defining short-term and circulatory migrants. Uh, in the CWD study, which Chindu has also referred, uh, we found that about 58% of female migration was short-term, and it was much higher for men. In fact, it was 64%. Uh, for women, another important issue in terms of ma macro data is the monocausal approach that uh, migration uh, or the migration data or the collection agencies tend to follow, uh, which makes a rigid distinction between economic and social reasons uh, uh, for migration. The respondents are required to give only one reason for migration, and in the case of women, invariably the reason for migration is identified as marriage. Uh, given the labor market segregations and concentrations that are evident from the employment data, women are mostly in, uh, employed in few sectors and occupations. And the chance of the two dispersed NSSO surveys to undercount women because the, the, the samples are all dispersed and since women are focused in particular sectors or concentrated in particular sectors, there is always an issue of undercounting of women in such situations also. Finally, studies have noted circulation of family units or male-female pairs for wage labor in some industries and activities that are completely you know, kind of manned by migrants. For example, in our study, uh, in the CWDS study, we have found that pairs or jodies are recruited to work in the bricklings or in the harvesting of sugar canes. These patterns suggest that the social or employment uh, relations that we think assume, which is always individual unit based, is actually not correct in terms of some of these uh, types of migration. There are also other issues with the, with the survey in terms of its conduct, which I, I will not highlight now for want of time. Uh, so what we what is the, the situation is that we have no credible data on migration uh, especially for women's labor migration. Now let's look at the micro data to just give you some sense as to what, where we are in terms of the data. The NSSO data, as I said, it was released in 2007-8 and it has a number of specific information, but it is, by now the data has been much analyzed and mostly it is known and it's also too old. Census data is relatively new, not because uh, you know, it was conducted just recently, but the fact that it was just recently been released and it is much, you know, compared to NSS data, it is a new set of data. So let me go to the slides, if you can, I can take to the first data slide, uh, Dimble. According to census, 40% of the total population in 2011 uh, were migrants, and for women it was 70%. Based on the NSS definition, in fact, 28% of the total population in 2007-8 were classified as migrants. Proportion of female internal migrants, as you can see, have increased both in rural and urban areas from 48% to 54% in rural and from 21 to 33% in urban. Now coming to the nature of movement, because that is actually very an important issue that when in, when in the discussion on migration, movement is mostly from rural to rural for women, which is 58%, followed by urban to urban and rural to urban movements. This is not labor migration. For men, it is, we can see that it is much more dispersed. Uh, if you look at uh, the reasons for migration, which is there in the next slide. Uh, uh, the, the data shows that women predominantly move for marriage. About 2005 or 2006 million out of the 3096 million, uh, there's 309.6 million female migrants, which is 66.5% reported marriage as a reason. This is deferred by destination, 77.7% of female migrants in rural areas and 44.7% of female migrants in urban areas reported marriage as a reason. The NSS 2007-8 figures are higher, where 91.2% uh, of the female migrants in rural areas and 60.8% percent of female migrants in urban areas citing marriage as the reason. In urban areas, uh, uh, women moved with the household, associational migration is also important that you can see from the data. Between, uh, but between the period, the proportion of marriage and family related migration for women shows a decline. 
it is also important for us to note that women who move for marriage can also work after moving this is well understood in rural areas where the new bride would be working in the fields and this is true to some extent in the urban areas also this can be seen in the huge difference between the number of women who moved for economic reasons and the number of working female migrants which i will come uh, to it a little later uh, the share of people migrating for work and business has increased for women which is clearly there while for men especially in urban areas this is showing a decline the declining share of employment related migration for men could be because of the fact that the earlier flow of migrants who were now settled in urban areas and that's why they are no longer reflected in the migration data the category others which you can see has shown an increase and it's high time that we explore as to what constitute this others in terms of the reasons in general while female migrants vastly outnumber male migrants in the migration data for india the proportion of female migrants identified for as moving for employment related reasons is so small as to be and it is often rendered insignificant in contrast to male migration uh, for employment reasons and this is taken as the most significant labor migration in all our understanding Uh, the monocausal approach that we have talked about followed by the migration macro surveys has been a major major factor in in camouflaging and in, in, in camouflaging at least some economic or labor based decisions of women's uh, in women's migration under other apparently uh, non economic social reasons this combined with the lack of adequate attention to short term migration where explicit labor migration for women is significant it leads to an underestimation of female labor migration which is inbuilt in the data set data that we have so even after several decades of macro data on migration we are presented a largely unchanging picture of women migrating for mainly social reasons and men for economic reasons the net result is an accepted tendency towards using as i said migration male migration as a primary indicator in the discussions on labor migration and develop and development changes at, uh, at the cost of a gendered analysis now coming to the next slide census figures actually shows us an increase in female migration as i have said for employment and business and an increased female share of such migrants from 12% to 16% over 2001 to 2011 this is based on the last place of residence data uh, in india data work employment migration is increasing both in rural and urban areas for women in rural areas from 30 lakhs to 45 lakhs and in urban areas from 1 lakh to 23.4 lakhs so, so uh, together it is about 70 lakhs of women migrants a study of the absolute numbers are also important and if you look at the absolute figures which is there in the next slide in 2011 female migration for employment in absolute number is about one fifth of the male migrants both in rural and urban areas which is not negligible if you think and uh, it to be uh, to be neglected like that and it is and this is even after all that under reporting that that is there in terms of female migration labor migration now coming to the nature of employment which is there in the next slide i'm hurrying it up because there are many other people to speak after me so when you look at the nature of migrant uh, nature of movement i think it's very important for us to note that migrants as a share of the rural and urban workforce has increased over this period mostly rural to rural for women which is 36% but shows a shift in the pattern of female migration from predominantly rural destinations to a distinct tilt towards urban destinations movement to, re, uh, to urban areas urban to urban which is 28% rural to urban is 30% so Uh, you know it is becoming significant the movement of women from rural to urban areas and urban to urban areas is, is the data is showing is increasing and it's a significant change that we need to notice 47% of all women migrating for work business were in urban areas by to in 2001 which is now has jumped to 58% next slide uh, such a trend is likely to be further enhanced since 2001 with the employment data showing a crisis and declining economic growth which is there in the uh, in the figure before you this is serious outcomes for employment uh, you know in in terms of women's employment particularly as you, we all, most of you may be knowing there has been a dramatic fall in the work participation rates among rural women by about 5.5 percentage uh, from 5. by 5.5 percentage points from 
to 19% over time. Reflecting that women's employment have, women have lost in terms of absolute numbers in, in terms of this employment decline. Although the decline is notable across all social groups, uh, it has been particularly important for uh, marginalized sections like the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribe categories uh, with a, a sharper decline, which has uh, been uh, written about earlier. Stagnation in urban India, we, you can see a stagnating picture in terms of women's work participation rate in urban India, which is around 15 to 14 percent. It's like always like that. Between 2004 and five, and uh, you know, seven, uh, 18 and 19, what we need to understand is that the female male gaps in gender uh, education attainment has narrowed considerably, which we thought is going to change the employment uh, pattern, employment trend. But this has not actually resulted in any change, but rather the, the shift, the, the, the two has actually gone in opposite direction. The employment uh, rates have actually declined over time. So in rural areas, uh, if you, next slide. In rural areas, about 86.7 million female migrants constituted 71% of the 122 million female workforce in 2011. Whether all such migrant workers rep represent aspects of female mobility is an issue because it's just workforce participation rate. Uh, uh, but they are all working. That means these many women who have uh, who have worked are migrants. It doesn't mean that they have given reasons as work or employment. In urban areas, about 12 uh, million working female migrants are there, where, which was uh, you know, about 44% of the 28 million female workforce in urban areas. You can see that the WPR of migrants are, general, are higher than the general uh, rates, 39 for migrants, and in, for general, which is only 30%. Uh, uh, 30% in rural areas. 20 in, uh, for migrants in urban areas, 15.4 for, uh, for general category, uh, for all women in urban areas. However, over time, we can see that the WPR for women have declined, for, uh, even for migrants as well, which is, uh, you know, it, which is uh, in tune with the larger decline in the female WPR in this period. Age-wise data is given in the next uh, slide. I think I will skip it. We can come back to this discussion a little later. But I just want to point uh, to, to talk about this particular slide, where we are uh, look uh, where the data is. The slide before that, um, yeah, uh, where migrants who are seeking marginal workers and non-workers among migrants who are seeking work. What is clear from this data is that there is an increasing number of women, or a large section of women who are actually looking for work in their destinations and who are currently unemployed. So now uh, let's come to uh, maybe the next slide. Not this slide, next slide. Opportunities for work are limited for women given high degree of segregation, which we know is there in the labor market and there are uh, clear injury restrictions for women uh, migrants as well. And this is evident from the macro data on women's employment. So this particular data shows the distinction between uh, the nature of employment. And of the three broad categories of women's employment, regular self-employed and casual workers, the share, share of regular employment among women workers in urban areas is the category which, has, which, which you can see has shown consistent increase uh, for more than three decades now. Uh, it is assumed that this denotes better forms and conditions of work for women workers. However, regular work is defined by the NSSO, not in terms of any duration of employment, irrespective of wages and other conditions of work. Thus, paid domestic work and other service sector employees who may be working and having insecure terms and conditions and may not even getting minimum wages will also be counted as regular workers. So this actual growth of temporary and casual employment is thus not adequately captured by the macro data. And there are segregations that we can see in terms of women's employment in, in, different, uh, in, in different segments. Now coming to the next slide, I think I will shift, uh, I will skip both those slides and we'll go to the, the last slide or the last to last slide, which is about the occupation. If you look at the, no, no, before that, sorry, before that, yeah, this one, thanks. Before that, no, 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 come down, come down with occupational distribution, 18, slide number 18. Yeah, if you look at the occupational distribution, this is for 2017-18 PLFS data, 
manufacturing is actually the single most single the largest or the single most occupation for female workforce in urban areas which is 45 lakhs uh, of which 20 lakhs were in textile and garment worker then garment work and another 16.5 were in food processing tobacco products pd and leather goods some 20% of these women workers are also home based workers uh, this is based on the study that Ravindran has done in 2019. Uh, teachers constitute another big chunk with, uh, uh, with those in pre-primary and secondary ed education numbering around 21 lakhs and another 6.5 in higher education. Domestic workers, as you can see, is 24 lakhs of which 20 are domestic workers and ayas and childcare workers are another 4 lakhs. There are about 11.3 lakhs of uh, workers who are in shops and sales, uh, who are in shops and or salespersons. Another 11 lakh in housekeeping and restaurant services, and 10.5 lakh in clerical work. Around 10 lakh of workers are in construction, and about 5 lakhs in health, health professionals and workers. Garbage collectors and beauticians are 4 lakhs each, and finance, the business, administrative, police, social work is 4.5. And one segment which I missed in between is about directors and executives, which is 16.6, which actually is stands apart from the rest of the categories of occupations that we have discussed. It is actually very difficult to say categorically locate the proportions of migrants in across these different occupations. But based on our understanding and of my, from the micro surveys and also the analysis of the 2007-8 NSS data, which is given in the next slide, uh, there are occupational concentrations and there are, uh, you know, the, the, there are sectors where the shares of women are much higher. So it is possible from those uh, in analysis to project that more, some of these sectors will have higher concentration of women and compared to other sectors. Uh, sectors like manufacturing, domestic workers, care workers, nurses, construction workers, garbage collectors will be predominantly migrants. Uh, where and there will be an over representation of women from marginalized caste groups in these categories of occupations. All other categories of work, we may have a mixed kind of a, uh, you know, a, 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 a mixed kind of a profile and migrants may be sometimes less in some categories of work. So uh, I will uh, you know, kind of conclude it by just saying that the macro data on migration with all its limitations and presuppositions conceals more than revealing many important features and trends in relation to labor, tender and migration that operate on the ground. It is, it is this neglect, uh, we feel, that why there is, uh, in fact, a lack of discussion on employment and migration of women, even in the context of the pandemic, where women are absent in almost all discussions. Assumption almost is that as if implications are the same for all. Uh, uh, in a pre-existing gender inequality in the labor market, which we have seen from the data, leaves women particularly vulnerable in this, the, the, the time of crisis. Uh, the slowdown in economic growth will surely lead to retrenchment of existing workers where women, especially migrants, have higher likelihood of termination from employment or having cuts in salaries compared to men. Uh, as family incomes further dec decline, decrease, Many women will be forced to join work who may not be right now in the, in, the, in the labor market and with no possibility of employment in rural areas, distress migration of women to urban locations is bound to happen. With, this, with restricted entry for women in many sectors and occupations, this will lead to massive unemployment and underemployment and undercounting of existing wages which are already very low in many of these sectors. Many of the feminized occupations are already facing such issues. One sector where women may compete for jobs, given the gendered understanding of work, is the paid domestic work. I'm sure this will be taken up by the panelists, by other panelists in their discussion later. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Indu. Yeah, thank you, Nita. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can. Okay, thank you, Nita. Thank you for pointing out uh, both the neglect as well as what the data does tell us if we look a probe deeper into it, as well as the fact that a lot of the rigidities continue and uh, continue to be reflected in the patterns that uh, emerge. Um, we shall now move to Indrani and we'd look to Indrani to also tell us what uh, lies, both uh, not just what lies beneath the concealed 
recycling aspect of the data and the neglect, but also how uh, the fact that women's labor migration continues to be neglected in the uh, analysis of migration trends and uh, the picture, how that in a sense um, obstructs or hampers uh, uh, and weakens the analysis and the understanding that we have of what is happening both to migrant, migrant labor, as well as the larger linkages between the experiences of migrant labor, both in rural and urban India, and what is the pattern of economic growth, what it tells us and what it hides. Both, I think, are important. And also, what may be more recent shifts that we may see, uh, which would give us an idea of what are the challenges. So, Indrani, you can start. Okay. So, uh, I don't think I'm going to cover the questions in exactly the same way that you have posed them, Indu. But I wanted to uh, begin by saying that the question of the gender dimensions that it is neglected has been glaringly brought to us in this, uh, in the discussions around migration, which have blossomed in a certain sense in the post-pandemic, in the post in the lo lockdown situation mainly because people don't know how to look at it. They just don't know how to look at the gender dimensions. So let me begin by say, just reiterating what we have been sort of saying for the last so many years. I just wanted to, to reiterate the neglect of gender in perspectives on labor migration. And equally, Equally, I would say that when women, when the spotlight is put on women's uh, labor migration, then there is an equal sort of uh, lack of a labor perspective in that approach. So let's just begin with that reiteration. Now there's a shortage of time. I just want to make four basic arguments and points in this presentation. And uh, that is, the first is, of course, on the question of the male bias in migration. And I'll discuss that. There is a male bias in labor migration in India. It has been the pattern. And it is the, the problem is that it has not been addressed. Undercounting is there. Undercounting of female labor migration is there. But the male bias to labor migration that is the dominant pattern that has to be analyzed in, a, in uh, a, its implications for gender need to be analyzed. So that is one aspect. The second point, I have a question that I would like to uh, uh, keep uh, uh, on the table is the question of uh, circular migration. A lot of it is within rural, and as Anita has pointed out, uh, uh, there's a, a very significant proportion of uh, women in the rural labor migration uh, streams. And in that, that uh, the question of uh, uh, the, how gender is completely ignored, even when there has been a focus. There is a lot of literature now on the question of circular migration. It is being discussed in several fora, but the gender dimensions are completely erased in that discussion. So I, there are certain questions that I, we wish to foreground as far as that is concerned. The third aspect is when it comes to independent women's uh, uh, labor migration, that is an independent migration by women, either alone or uh, in uh, uh, all female uh, groups. And this is something which uh, everybody who wants to talk about women in lab uh, women's labor migration like to focus only on this particular thing. But the question is that there is inbuilt into this focus on independence thing a lens which is linked to an understanding about trafficking. And this, this disturbs the whole analysis and it puts it, it, puts it uh, I mean, there's a sort of restrictive, draconian and regressive approach that sort of penetrates the whole approach to independent women's migration, except, except when it comes to the, uh, uh, the, the new uh, sort of period of uh, uh, that we are uh, currently in, except in the when skill training, through skill training, sing, uh, uh, women, uh, yeah, particularly young women, 
are being trained to supply a cheap labor source to particular industries. So except there, where there's a positive spin on the migration of young women, and the state also plays a role nowadays, except for there, the other side is this trafficking lens, which has a, a, a lot of implications, which I'll discuss later. The fourth point is, fourth aspect that I want to raise is that in the context of what we thought, uh, mentioned the uh, urban words shift, the, sh the, uh, the increasing importance of urban destinations in female labor migration, whether it is from urban to urban, but a significantly increased proportion from rural to urban as well. In that, I, I think there is a need to foreground and to bring to the, uh, to the table the manner in which the Areas where women are concentrated, uh, women workers, migrant women workers are concentrated, coincide with the most unregulated and deprived uh, of any kind of uh, decent conditions of work. So it foregrounds, in a sense, the importance of the discussion on labor laws that is currently uh, ongoing around the labor courts. And I would like to uh, discuss a few points in relation to that. Now, let me first begin with the first point. I don't know how, whether I'll be able to cover everything. Indu, you'll have to keep a, a, a check on me. <laughs> but anyway, the question of the male bias. The first, I mean, let, let, it is something that we have tried to address by referring to the fact that, no, no, there are more women migrating. Yes, there are def there's definitely undercounting. Census has put the share of female migra migration for work and employment and business at 16%. That will be an undercounting. It may go up to 20%, 25%. NSS is also undercounted. There is an undercount. There's a lot of sections in rural areas as well as in urban areas where women migration is given for other reasons, but it's not, uh, and it's not reflected the fact that they are actually migrant workers. But the fact of the matter is that the structure of labor migration, even though the share of women is increasing from 12 to 16 percent across the decade 2001 to 2011, despite that, let us not close our eyes to the fact of the male bias in labor migration. Now, why is it important? Because it, it it is important for us to understand that if there's a male bias to, migrate, uh, to labor migration, then the, in the, the structure of the uh, uh, workforce in non-agriculture will be reflected in that, with, uh, that male bias will get reflected. It creates a hostile environment for women to enter employment also, because they, there's very, they are left with only those segments where there's a distinct preference for women and which is associated with gender ideologies, like women are supposed to do domestic work, women are supposed to do certain care functions, women can do certain kinds of functions alone. So this element, this they may do some textile manufacturing, there's a certain gender bias and ideology around that, which then causes preference for women in certain segments, and that's the only place where women really find employment in, on any scale. Now, this is a function of the fact that there's a, a male bias in migration and the whole labor market is structured like that. And let me say that employers are also responsible for this because it must be understood that if women are left behind in the village, and men are going to uh, migrate for employment, it's part of the low wage extraction economy that has been part of the uh, development of capitalism in India. And it has seen a sharper shift in the re recent past when you've seen the fall in wages in relation to uh, 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 other uh, profits that uh, Ravi Srivastava has been writing about related. But the low wage economy, why the low wage economy? Because the male worker's wage does not have to cover the social reproduction uh, 
of his family, his, the wife, the child, that part of that is being borne by the village economy. Now we have a situation where you have agrarian crisis, you have the, uh, the uh, a problem of survival and subsistence even within the village economy. And so you need that wage that comes in, uh, the money income that is coming in from the rural, uh, 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 other migrant labor. But you, the migrant worker is unable to support a family because of the low wage. Now this is something which needs to be, there's a venality to the idea that you can use poor workers in this particular way. You do not have to, employers can make money out of their labor, but they will not have to support the uh, uh, families and, uh, of, of, and, and the uh, social reproduction of the worker, workforce that they are actually utilizing. This is an element which is not put, factored in when this whole discussion takes place. And it has a gender dimension because it also uh, brings in not only the division of the family in the way that it is, uh, uh, comes, but it also means that women's wages necessarily become unequal. We do not see, for example, when women are migrating, when women do migrate uh, uh, along with the household or along with the family, it is characterized by unpaid labor, a, a larger share of unpaid, uh, uh, the unpaid element, and it is also characterized by unequal wages. Because if you have a troop of workers, of which let's say 10 are all male, and three or four are uh, with their uh, with women folk, then what you have is that the women are always paid less than the men because it is considered that hers is a supplementary wage. So the inequality in wages, which is almost a defining feature everywhere in agriculture, in construction, in all the segments that you can think of where both genders are in, in the labor force, you see this uh, one of the, it is a certain outcome also of this male bias in the labor migration uh, pattern. Now to come to the second uh, point, we can discuss this further. I hope there will be some questions, but to come to the second point regarding circular migration. As, as I said, there's a lot, there has been a lot of discussion about circular migration now, and there are lots of organizations who really try, have tried to organize uh, these circular and seasonal migrants in various ways, including trade unions, but including also NGOs and other uh, organizations. But the fact of the matter is, in this circular migration streams, what are the, as we know, the main things we have heard in our, we have found in our own research is for brick kilns, of course, agriculture is top, and I'll discuss that later. But for brick kilns and for uh, uh, construction, for uh, and as uh, and you know, uh, these are the areas where you have this particular kind of circular migration, sort of inbuilt into the system. Because in construction, you have you have a whole lot of uh, uh, corporatization on the capital side, but on the labor side, if they do not employ the uh, workers on any permanent basis. They keep them as a casual labor force, uh, as a flexible force which they can call on when they want and get rid of when they don't want them. So construction you have had, it's not an unorganized industry. As an industry, it is moving towards a high level of organization on the capital side and corporatization. But as far on the labor side, they have maintained a casualized labor force. Now in that, in, in the construction uh, segment and in the brick kilns, which is relatively more unorganized, but serves the uh, uh, construction uh, sector. In these, you see this, uh, as uh, Anita mentioned, the jodis and the family. The unit of labor is the family. And when the unit of labor is the family, and the payment is made at peace rate, effectively it means that women do not have an independent wage. Now this is a an issue which we from CWDS have been putting before all these segments of organizers of migrant workers. It is not something that has been picked up or taken up. And I do feel that it is time that this question of unpaid labor of women, it benefits the employers. But on the on the worker side, 
they may be getting a little more than an individual wage, like get one and a half wage, a uh, person's wage. Whatever it is, the point is it generates a certain inequality, which is not being addressed by any of the, the voices that are talking about circular uh, uh, migration. Mm. Let me, how much time will do? A third point. Huh? Rani, I think not more than five minutes now. Okay. So as far as the third point and the question of independent uh, women's migration is concerned, as I said, there are two approaches that have been sort of being pushed. The first is the trafficking lens. And uh, I'd like to uh, uh, say that independent women's migration is not a generalized phenomenon across the country. And you see this, uh, and uh, we, we recently CWDS did this study in Odisha, 20 villages. And 20, in the 20 villages, we, uh, you could see that independent migration of women was uh, only uh, in from four. The rest of the 16 villages, there was no independent migration by uh, women. In, and in fact, overall, it was that 6% of the households actually had women going out either as, uh, along with their families or along with or independently only six percent were sending out women migrants in comparison to 43 percent of the households sending out men just to reiterate the point of the male bias now the, so it's it's only in certain pockets and it's usually uh, uh, sort of certain communities that are particularly targeted for this independent and domestic workers, uh, live-in domestic workers has been a particular stream. Although we know that majority of the migrant workers in domestic service in domestic, as domestic workers are live out and uh, uh, workers, but still, this is a particular stream of independent migration by women. And everywhere, this stream is sort of now under the trafficking uh, framework and uh, there is this new law which uh, was uh, has lapsed uh, a bill which has lapsed it is a draconian bill full of uh, surveillance uh, mechanisms and uh, from top to bottom and our experience our study in Odisha showed that it is actually just chasing young women who are uh, migrating for domestic work there is no trafficking associated with that uh, that kind of thing. of course there may be some there is there is exploitation and there is a definite thing but it, that has to be linked to the fact that they do not have uh, there's no law for domestic workers there are no protective rights it's not a decent work regime all those things so it foregrounds that rather than the trafficking lens which sends the police chasing them and uh, ruining their lives actually because it sort of they would become stigmatized even more and we can discuss this element but let me come to the last point which is in the context of the urban world shift now Mita has made the task easy by showing the particular structure of urban employment in which migrants are concentrated and it does mean that these are the segments where you need labor rights there has to be a greater focus on that and the codes, the four codes that the government has introduced, the wage on codes, uh, uh, the code on wages, which has already uh, become law, the uh, uh, occupational safety, health, and working conditions code, uh, the code on social security, and the code on industrial uh, uh, relations. So the, you have these four codes now amalgamating some 30 odd. Uh, labor laws in the country. Now, I'm not going into the amalgamation part of it, but I just want to point out a certain, some of the things that are there in the labor courts, which are pro hugely problematic and which have been regressive as far as women workers' rights are concerned. The first is, of course, in relation to the Try to wind up, okay? Just yeah, yeah. Very Code on wages, I just, just two points I'll make. The code on wages uh, does not include private household. So domestic workers are excluded. In most states, domestic workers had been able to enter the minimum wage regime by their struggles. Many of the major states, and some of course were still there, but they, that this had been the direction of struggle. The code on wages removes that advantage that they had achieved because it removes, it doesn't include private households in its uh, definition of 
uh, workplace or employment. So that's one thing. Similarly, the same thing is true for home-based workers, but I'm not going into that. The second thing is that as far as the code occupation on uh, uh, occupational health, safety, and working conditions, occupational safety, health, and working conditions, that code does not include sexual harassment. So the violence that women experience in the workplace or the possibilities of the preventive measures against that, that has been left outside. And this raises this question that when it comes to women's issues, it is being segregated in the workplace. It gets segregated from the labor perspective and the labor organization and uh, the labor law enforcement machinery. Why, for example, does the labor department have no role to play as far as sexual harassment is concerned? It, that law, OSH, is not part of the labor courts. It's not been amalgamated. It's been kept separate. It's been, if it's been kept separate, there's a reason. Why is it the labor law, uh, labor department is not involved? Because they don't have to think about gender. As it is, you have a problem in several of the laws. They don't recognize the gender issue. But the labor department does not have to be made gender sensitive. Sexual harassment is the domain of the women and child development. They don't know anything about labor. They don't look at it. So anyway, as far as the trade unions are concerned, also let me point out that at this time, women workers are a dynamic force in the trade unions also. Their share of trade union membership is to be more than their share of the workforce. And they have they have emerged as a dynamic element in the current phase of the trade union movement. So in such a context, it is all the more important not to segregate the women out of the labor movement also. So this I will I'll just uh, stop here because I think it's the thing. How long did I take? Yeah. Thank you, Indrani. I think uh, we uh, have to move on. Uh, thank you for pointing out how the male bias in um, the, uh, even both the data and the analysis of migration data uh, creates conditions for also putting a parda on the nature of women's contribution and as well as the nature of exploitation, which it allows for, especially in terms of women's unpaid labor. Uh, which is part of the strategy of capitalist development through low wage economic uh, sort of ex um, participation and extraction. Um, I'd like to, you have brought us more into the urban uh, arena in terms of the last part of your presentation, but I think uh, we'd like to invite Nitya who has been working much more in terms of the rural context. And I think the rural context, in fact, re-emerges in the present debate on migration because the reverse or retur migrant, re uh, migrant returnees who we will see in rural India, uh, I think the focus again uh, needs to be brought back to what happens in rural India. Uh, how will gender relations, how will women's participation in this phase of the economy play out based on what is our past experience and the studies that Nitya has been. So Nitya, we'd uh, like to welcome you and uh, please take the Thanks very much uh, Indu and also to Indrani and Nita, I think for setting the floor so I can kind of, uh, you know, move, move the uh, some of the key issues that I wanted to talk about in the context of rural women uh, migrants. Uh, but also in terms of gender, I think what is the impact of male migration on these rural women and women's work uh, and women's labor. So I think I just wanted to start with differentiating between you know, the discourse on labor and labor laws and so on, which Indrani uh, pointed to towards the end, but also on women's work itself. Because I think in a rural context, it's not just the unpaid work in terms of domestic work, but it's also a lot of the productive work, which remains invisible, undercounted, not paid, and so on. Of course, a big category is what has been classified in farming as unpaid household help. So most rural women are working full time. And I did a time use study and we even find that, you know, eight to 10 hours during peak planting, harvesting seasons. But their work is kind of, uh, I mean, the households know that the women are working and the men do recognize it. But I think in any kind of formal mechanism, 
in terms of either access to Kisan credit cards or in terms of access to any other resources. I think because they don't have land titles, they get marginalized. I mean, I was just reminded, I was looking at this uh, the Atma Nirbhar announcement by the finance minister where she said that for farmers, Kisan credit cards are going to be increased. Actually, it's only 2 to 4% of women who have access in rural India. It varies by state, of course, to Kisan uh, credit cards. And if you think that more than 50% of agricultural labor or agricultural work is actually being done by women. So you start with grave inequalities, uh, you know, in terms of understanding of work and labor, when we look at the rural context. And I think part of the problem is because of the definition itself. I think it's also been us in the women's movement who've looked at production and reproduction and who have actually advocated for recognition of unpaid work, unpaid care work. This is now SDG 5.4. But actually, there's also a lot of unpaid labor or unpaid productive work and underpaid, of course, but also totally unpaid, which is taking place. And I think we haven't really paid adequate attention uh, to that. And this is partly because of the continuum, I think, of work. The classifications are very difficult, just like Nita pointed out from the data. I think even qualitatively, when we look at activities, so you look at kitchen gardening or you look at, uh, you know, power boiling, uh, for, uh, in terms of post-harvest processing or storage or women taking small amounts to weekly markets to sell in exchange for purchase of vegetables or other uh, food consumption uh, commodities. So lots of little, little tasks which could fall either within production or reproduction. And I think there is a really a continuum, uh, continuum there. Having um, said that, of course, whatever women work, they do work, whether it's in production or reproduction in rural areas, they have very little access. They're not paid largely. They have no tools. They have very long working hours and they have little support in terms of whether it's information extension or indeed for domestic work. We looked in rural areas now that there is this Ujwala scheme to provide LPG cylinders, but actually most rural households get maybe one cylinder a year. So this is not really sufficient. They're still very much dependent on firewood collection and so on. So from the trends that uh, Nita showed in terms of uh, a migration for work has increased from 12% to 16%. And I think Nita also pointed out that even though a large part is marriage migration, actually when women migrate from marriage, they also work wherever they go to their destination, whether it's to another rural area or to an urban area. So the marriage migration is a bit of a category which is misleading because it's not that women don't do work. In fact, a lot of the live out domestic workers in cities are basically who have migrated for marriage. A lot of women from the villages coming, especially from Eastern India, Bengal, Bihar, Jharkhand, who come to Delhi because their husband is employed in a factory or in some kind of informal work. And most of them end up doing live out domestic work. The other very interesting thing, I think, is uh, education. And I've done some other work that actually there's a huge aspiration uh, for women um, at, uh, in terms of education now, because this is also a claim. I think there was early work and Dina Dee was in CWDS and Hannah Pap Papanek and so on in the 80s about status production, that actually the kind of work which they aspire for is white collar or sort of educated work. And especially now in rural areas with the opening up of, uh, you know, Arsha's, Anganwadi workers, para teachers. So there's a lot of aspiration. It's very low paid and it's seen as volunteer. So this is also the inequality of wage, which uh, Indrani spoke about. But actually, it has really created a push for education because we are, even though low waged, these types of work give much more status and dignity than other forms of work that women uh, perform. So I think that's a very important issue in terms of work, which has come out with the COVID, that is the dignity of work, whatever be the work and the, and the need when women are also moving for work or not moving for work, the, uh, the search really, or their uh, attempts to really secure respectable work or get respectability uh, for work. I think the patterns in terms of Indu gave in her introduction about construction, brickins, family migration, independent work, and Indrani has spoken about domestic work as independent work. Uh, so I'll skip over that. But I just had some interesting, uh, something that I wanted to, to say in terms of migration, which is about, of course, there is inequality. But I think uh, there's also sort of intersecting inequalities, that there are certain groups of women, even within women, who tend to be much more marginalized and face much greater inequalities and injustices 
compared to other women. And I'm particularly have worked since 1994 with Santhal women in particular, with tribal women. And I think tribal women, Dalit women, uh, landless households, women from landless households, even within the larger category of women, they tend to uh, confront much greater barriers in terms of moving from uh, sort of very low paid, uh, unequal work to something slightly better. The other thing I wanted to say is that apart from these intersection inequalities, there are also historical shifts and we find patterns of migration in rural areas changing very rapidly. And it's very important to understand something which Indrani uh, alluded to, that is the agrarian change and the agrarian distress and the changes that are happening actually in terms of the larger economic processes. I'll just give one or two examples to uh, make, make my points uh, clearer. So talking really about the Santhals, where I worked in Santhal Pradana since 1994. Uh, this is now in Jharkhand state. At that time, it was in Bihar, adjacent to West Bengal. And of course, it has a long history of migration during colonial period and so on. And they moved to Assam, to the tea plantations. Santhals were very much constructed by the colonialists as labor, as good labor. And they still, I think that's something, that's an identity that they're still <coughs> trying to overcome. Now, 1960s, 70s, 80s, I think as West Bengal, agriculture started improving, particularly with irrigation development and the tube wells and so on in Bardhaman. The planting of paddy increased from one to two to three seasons of triple cropping in uh, parts of West Bengal. They needed labor. each time for planting, transplanting and harvesting. And they went in groups of female labor, maybe with one or two men uh, to accompany. And as Nita pointed out, this kind of labor completely falls off the radar of data because it's often less than even one month. But if you count the whole year, it may be about three to four months that they are moving uh, there. It was very interesting when I was doing my work earlier in uh, 19, late 90s, 2000s, that men in fact hardly moved at that time because they really prided themselves as farmers and cultivators. So the identity of Santhal men as chasa hod, as cultivators was very important. They didn't want to see themselves as labor, but rather as cultivators and farmers. So they stayed back and the women kind of moved as uh, labor. What has happened now? Actually, Jharkhand was formed in, 20, in 2000. And in 20 years, we find a real reversal of pattern. First of all, I think some of you may be knowing the Jharkhand movement, therefore, was very much around natural resources, land, water, forest, gel, jungle, jameen. They wanted access to these resources. But after 2000, very rapid alienation of resources for mining, for urbanization, for many other reasons people haven't had. And where men didn't want to move in the mid-90s. Now, almost from every Santhal village, you find men moving. Uh, to distant locations. So they don't like to go to West Bengal for this uh, nearby location. They go to South or Maharashtra, Gujarat, Kerala, Tamil Nadu or UP for the sort of Green Revolution, Western UP, Punjab for both agriculture and for other kinds of things. Now they are away for nine to 10 months, but very interestingly, they finish plowing and then move in August and come back around this time, May, uh, April, May with some resources that they bring for investment into farming. And this has been the kind of arrangement for the last some years. Now, what has been the implication in the recent time because of COVID? So we've been doing some quick work around this. So first we found a group of Santhal women who had gone to West Bengal for potato harvest. This has been called as Alu Jom in Vardhaman. Potato, which they get a both wage and in kind, a bora a sack of potato, which they bring back. And they were paid, but the lockdown happened and they were stuck uh, in West Bengal. So these women then, they finished the harvest work, of course, but they were paid, but they could not carry the sack of potatoes. They ended up walking back home to Pakur in the Santhal Pardanas. They sold off very cheaply the potatoes and came back with some cash. So there is this kind of a wage inequality when it's a mix of cash and kind because of the sudden lockdown. The second thing that has happened is that where men have been away and have got stranded, uh, uh, the women, of course, uh, have been in contact because of mobile phones and things like that. And this has had two implications. One is when the Nariga has opened up, a lot of women, in addition to everything else, have started going to Nariga sites. So almost 95% of uh, uh, work now is on Nariga sites, in addition to all the other work that they are doing in the uh, field, really reducing their leisure time, I think with terrible implications or quite bad implications for their own health. The third thing is indebtedness. 
I think rural surveys have shown that women are borrowing from the village money lender or whoever to send to their men because many of these men stranded in distant locations have had to pay. I think as you would have seen in the media and so on for trucks, even for shamik trains, for lorries, for buses, for other vans in order to return home, whether it is in Tamil Nadu migrant labor staff or in other places. So they have had to pay quite large amounts of money, four, five thousand rupees in order to get transport. They don't have that kind of savings. So whatever they had, they have spent why during the lockdown for purchase of food and other things. And women have had to borrow. And unfortunately, the one asset that women have is jewelry or gold for the few women who have it. So a lot of mortgage of their own asset. So at the end of this period, they're going to find women completely assetless, no cash, heavily indebted, no jewelry left, you know, completely assetless in very vulnerable uh, uh, situations. Uh, the third thing, of course, has been in terms of food itself. And when I talked in the beginning about production and reproduction, actually women's task is not just agricultural production, but also in terms of actually arranging for the food to be put on the table. And, you know, there's been, I've written about sort of gender equality and food and nutrition security and so on. But what has happened now is no income coming from men. As uh, Indrani also pointed out, that this has been very important for their livelihoods because of, uh, you know, uh, it's of course balanced with agriculture, but it's not enough. So PDS, yes, they have got basic cereals, but for anything else, including LPG cylinders or other things, if they need to purchase, then they have had to also borrow money. But we find rural surveys are showing that a general decline in consumption, almost by 50% in rural households, which is going to have effects not just on women's health, but of course on care burdens. Because if you're malnourished, if a lack of nutrition for a sustained period of time and people fall ill, then who's going to look after? It's again going to be women, in addition to everything else, trying to earn money to also look after sick people. I think again from tribal India, both Santhal Parganas and Orissa, I'm personally very worried <laughs> because what has happened with public health is that they have completely focused on uh, COVID and uh, they have trained all the ashas, the uh, Anganwadi workers, of course, Anganwadis are closed, but in terms of awareness, tracing, uh, quarantining and so on, which is a good thing. But all the regular tasks in terms of immunization in the Santhal Parganas has not taken place in Odisha, Koraput. It hasn't taken place for the last three months. When monsoon come, which has come now in many of these parts, it's a malaria season, of course. And I remember when I was doing my field work in Dumka, there's falciparum. I was also affected by that. A lot of people die of falciparum and other virulent forms of malaria. April, May, June is really used for spraying and precautions and so on for other infectious diseases, including malaria. And this year, none of this has happened. It has all come to a standstill. So we are going to have a kind of health disaster where malaria will increase the plowing season and the transplanting will come in July now because monsoon has already started. And there, there's going to be a real, I think, fatality, in fact, or high mortality crisis for which nobody is completely invisible. And transplanting, of course, is women's work and completely invisible. How are they going to manage with this transplanting uh, in poor health uh, context? So I think uh, there are a couple of other points, but of course, for returning migrants, there has also been an issue of safety in quarantine facilities, no proper quarantine facilities, no proper toilets, sexual harassment. Of course, Indrani sexual harassment, not only at the workplace, but also has been taking place when women are going to try and get money from money lenders or contractors and so on. It is often for Santhal women, they, they have to trade in, in a way, give some kind of sexual favors in return for getting uh, even loans. So I think that's, uh, the, it's, uh, so the nature of work and the nature of women's responsibility in terms of, in terms of what they're doing, I think work, and the, if you just, it's, we need to really look at it as beyond even labor. So my last few points of what do we do in terms of what are the priority areas that I see is really coming out in terms of using this opportunity to really raise some of the issues to address this neglected dimension in terms of women's uh, migration in the labor migration story. I think one thing that has happened thanks to Bollywood and thanks to the middle class is a lot of visibility to domestic work. So you have Bollywood stars doing jhadu pocha, this kind of thing. But I hope that, you know, uh, this uh, jokes apart that this can actually give visibility to the content of some of women's domestic labor, whether it is in the middle class or also what our paid domestic workers do. And actually 
make it make it a case for proper you know leave uh, uh, leave uh, uh, registration leave adequate wages employment benefits and so on lots of stories coming from the ISST study of domestic workers in Delhi that actually a few women are getting paid for not being able to go because of lockdown by their employers but the majority are not getting paid and are really struggling in terms of survival the second issue is um, I think on a positive side, perhaps, that even though women's work, content of women's work has increased, I think they are much more visible in the public sphere. Uh, whether you have in Kerala, uh, women cooking and providing to this thing or taking health care or in Uttarakhand, you know, women making masks, packets of nutritional inputs, partly because migrant men are stranded or they have come and they're in quarantine uh, facilities. But Hopefully, this could create a space for some kind, maybe, of negotiations around redistribution of work and redistribution of responsibilities towards greater uh, equality. Because, of course, SDG 5.4 put it all on people and, you know, as an optional thing in terms of people can try and redistribute. Hopefully, there will be some amount of redistribution. The two last points, one is social protection and social security. I think this is really exposed the need for proper social security, proper rights. I mean, the informal, low paid, poor working conditions, no facilities, no rights, you know, some degree of recognition of the content of work and some basic implementation of labor laws, which uh, I just wanted to emphasize, uh, not repeat, but just say that's really important in terms of the labor code and the labor laws and to make sure that some degree of both social protection as well as labor legislation is really brought into play, especially as far as migrant workers. I think it's completely exposed the Interstate Migrant Workers Act has not really, has been shown as being completely hollow. And really we need to strengthen our provisions. And the final point is really a point about structural change. And I think Indrani alluded to this about rural distress and agrarian uh, distress. So. In terms of migration, I think a lot of this rural migration is taking place because of distress, because people are not making able ends meet, especially for landless tribal Dalit women. So there is really a need, very urgent need to argue for uh, an advocate for a strengthening of improving livelihoods in rural areas. I think where that has happened, that like in Gorakhpur with the help of some NGOs, people, women are staying, they are cultivating and so on. So there's a real need to improve local livelihoods, to make sure that there's support, that people are really, if they migrate, they migrate out of choice with protection and with legal protection and not out of distress. And this only can then lead to providing dignity to the work that women uh, do. Thank you, Indrani. I'll stop there. Uh, Nitya, thank you very much. I think we're really running late and I don't want to cut into Praveena's time. Uh, I'm sure she uh, will add a lot to this discussion. So I'm not even going to try and uh, establish the link, but I think you have done um, uh, sort of uh, opened up both the rural distress in many more ways and the challenges in the contemporary uh, phase, particularly. Uh, so uh, linking it with the pandemic. So Praveena, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Indu, and thank you to all of you at CDS for inviting me to uh, give this talk. Um, I'm going to be speaking about international migration and uh, women's um, you know, position in the context of international migration, uh, much more than uh, migration within the country. International migration seems to be male-dominated, at least visibly so, because we have so little information really on one segment of women international migrants, that is those in the low earning or uh, earning income categories. We know a great deal more about skilled women who migrate, uh, nurses, um, medical professionals, basically health professionals, but also IT workers and so on. Uh, as far as um, domestic workers and workers in allied occupations, like in uh, cleaning in hospitals, ayas in schools, in uh, retail, shop girls, hotels, etc., we have very, very little information. Now, of course, the Indian uh, regulatory system actually enumerates um, those who go in uh, low earning 
categories because we have something called the emigration check required uh, regime, which um, enumerates uh, migrants who are going overseas uh, who do not possess um, more than 10 years of education. So typically, uh, women who are going in these categories should be enumerated. But because of a whole lot of restrictions that are imposed on women, uh, a large part of this migration is really irregular and they do not get immigration clearance, but they go by evading the laws. So if you look at the immigration clearance and uh, ECR statistics and you know, uh, estimates that we get from destination sources, there's a huge gap. Of course, one, the ECR statistics tells us about flows, whereas destination statistics tells us about stock. But even so it's very apparent that there is a huge discrepancy. Uh, now, as far as international migration is concerned, the bulk of this migration is really to the Middle East, and especially when we're looking at less skilled migrants or low income categories of migrants, whether it's men or women. Uh, there are two kinds of clustering that is really important to understand women's migration uh, to the Middle East. And one is occupational clustering, I've already mentioned it. And as far as the Middle East is concerned, domestic workers and nurses are two really important clusters. Um, another kind of clustering is also important to understand the scale of migration because of the macro level at which we see uh, migration and then we think that women are really a very small proportion. But if we look at, there is spatial clustering of migration of women. My, women migrants in low earning uh, categories are clustered in specific regions, not even states. Even within Kerala, which is one of the largest sending uh, source regions, they're clustered in particular areas in the coastal region in the highland regions these are basically poverty prone areas now they're also clustered in areas in andhra pradesh and actually andhra pradesh today is the largest source region of international uh, migrant women who go as domestic workers and they're clustered interestingly in very prosperous um, agriculturally very uh, uh, very prosperous region of the, the Godavari Delta region of both East and West Godavari. But they are women of the oppressed caste. They're largely scheduled caste women who go from this region, which is again very atypical because you don't find scheduled caste in overseas migration. So this is a very interesting case where you find that scheduled castes have had access to international migration. This is not the case in Kerala. In Kerala, it's largely OBCs, Christian, um, Muslim, but also increasingly OBC Hindu women. And uh, you know, scheduled castes and scheduled tribes are still emerging or sort of now uh, coming into the stream. So if we need to really understand the scale of migration, we need to really look at the spatial clustering within uh, these micro regions. And then particularly if you look at the Godavari region, you'll find that in that particular area, it's almost 50-50 women and men. And, and some people would even tell you that there are far more women migrants than male migrants. So it's really important to keep this in mind. Now, the second point I want to make is about the nature of mobility. And I've already mentioned because of the kind of restrictions that the Indian government imposes on women who go in the ECR category. One is the age regulation. Women who are below 30 years of, years of age are not supposed to go. And many of them do go uh, in a survey that I did over 40% of the women going from the Andhra Pradesh were below uh, 30 years. So they evade, and therefore it's irregular mobility. Again, they're not enumerated, but it has other kinds of implications. But in 2016, the government moved towards a far more stringent regime. What they did was they banned all private recruitment in the ECR category to the uh, ECR countries, including the Middle East. So what this basically means is that you could only go through government stipulated public sector recruiting agencies. And at present, there are nine of those that are allowed to recruit. But if you look at the statistics until recently, they were recruiting very little. So uh, from the time there was a migration, I mean, the ECR statistics shows a peak of about 20,000 women who went in 2010. And in 2016, after this regulation came into being, it started to dip and it actually went below 500. And in 2018, in the Godavari two Godavari districts, which accounted previously for about 60 to 75% of all migration of women in uh, the ECR category, it was zero. 
can you imagine and women were actually going so that so there's a great deal about the kind of um, regulatory uh, framework and and its acceptability but also the kind of data that we have now um, now we uh, currently um, migration is permitted only through these nine public sector agencies or directly by foreign employers who go through the e migrate system and the problem there is that if you go directly through the e migrate system you have to uh, pay this huge a security deposit of $2,500. And therefore, if a foreign employer can actually get a woman without paying it through an irregular challenge, that is preferable. And, and private recruiters continue to be very active in, regular, in uh, recruiting women and, that, and women continue to go through irregular channels. Another very important factor that is, uh, needs to be taken into account in understanding the recent trends in international migration of women as domestic workers and low paid uh, work is that there is a huge an increase in the demand for domestic workers and um, uh, domestic workers in the Middle East in particular. Uh, this is because uh, there's been a huge increase in work participation right, uh, rates of nationals, of women nationals, because of the Arabization programs in, or the nationalization programs in each of these countries. That's one uh, part of the increasing demand. The second part is the process of aging, which is also raising the demand for care workers, particularly care workers who will stay at home and take care of the aged. And therefore, there's a huge pressure from the destination countries to recruit women from these source countries. And these, you know, spatial uh, regional clusters happen to be very long term uh, source or, and, uh, areas. And there are really very strong social networks or informal networks. And therefore, there's, there is, this demand really comes right down to the local areas. And this is leading to a great deal of irregular mobility as well. Now, uh, one of the consequences of the rising demand has been that there's uh, women now at present in uh, uh, recent fieldwork that I have done has shown that they're no longer required to pay any expenses to go overseas. In fact, uh, disproportionate um, expenses was one of the problems that women migrants encountered. They were basically poor women and they were made to pay very large amounts in order to go, but they aspired to go and so they would take loans, etc. Now, very wide, in a widespread way, they've been saying, no, we no longer have to pay anything. And that, that is another incentive really to go. But uh, while they don't have to pay any expenses, this, you know, I must just explain something about the system in the Middle East. Um, the system in the Middle East, which is basically the Kapala uh, rules as well as the labor uh, rules, um, actually prevent uh, or require that any migrant should not be paying any of their expenses. The expenses for migration should be paid by the sponsors. But for a long period of time, what has happened is that the sponsors pay those expenses and the intermediaries basically take that money. They do not pass it on to the worker. So the worker also ends up paying. At present, because it's become so difficult to cater to that demand, intermediaries are actually recruiting workers without those expenses. But one of the things that has come to light from the Middle East, uh, which is linked to this, is that because women are not paying their expenses and intermediaries are really restricted to the kind of commission that they get, they don't get that additional amount, when a woman wants to return before her contract is over, that is before the contract is usually for two years, and if she wants to return before three months is passed, then the recruiting agent is supposed to pay for her return. She's not supposed to pay her own expense. But if she stays for longer than that, then she's supposed to pay for her own expense. Now, what recruiting agents do when a woman wants to come back is they hold her hostage. And there are all kinds of media reports that are coming in now saying that women are being held hostage, they're not being allowed to go by the uh, recruiting agent, etc. And this is really an outcome of this very interesting and seemingly benign shift. Well, it is benign if it is favorable to women, if women do uh, stay on longer. But for those who return, want to return, it actually uh, has this uh, twist in the tail or whatever. Um, now, I would um, like to say something about how do women actually move in this context, in the context of the heightened restrictions? 
One of the things, of course, is they're not supposed to be recruited by private agents, but then also there is far more of vigilance and uh, in the airports now than there was previously, so women say. And this is also very interesting because what we hear in the media is that women largely are migrating through visit visas. Visit visas are not employment visas, and there, so there's no way of knowing that they are actually going there for employment. But there's some very interesting kind of manipulations that are at foot of these visit visas because I learned that the visit visas that women apparently go on, the paper says visit visas, but they're actually employment visas that are digitally altered. When you have a visa, an electronic visa, the agents here actually electronically manipulate them and make them appear on the face of it as a visit visa. But the woman actually possesses a regular work visa. But with that work visa, she will not be allowed to go from here. Unless, of course, her employer, her sponsor, has you know, recruited her through the e-migrate website paying $2,500. So he doesn't do that. But this visa is digitally altered and she can go. So a number of them actually go like that. They also go through what women call company visas. These are visas for work in establishments, in commercial establishments. In the Middle East, you have domestic work visas and you have establishment visas. So they go on commercial visas and they work in, house, in houses. And then there is the old route of pushing, which is basically bribing the airport officials to allow women to go. But this has meant that women from Kerala go through airports. You know, they've been going from Ahmedabad, from Pune, from Nagpur, and wherever pushing is operated, which means means you need to find a pliable uh, airport official to um, uh, allow you to go. Now, uh, the last um, uh, set of issues that um, I want to address are what are the implications of uh, this kind of irregular migration or the, you know, the nature of migration and, and the position of women as domestic workers in this COVID time, crisis time. And uh, there are two elements to it. Now, women either who work in the Middle East either work in full-time regular employment with their sponsors. That is, they work, live with their sponsors. The sponsors are supposed to take care of them. And by and large, there's very little information about these women. They seem to be working because there hasn't been any disruption. But even previously, we know that work, full-time work in, in a sponsor's home is risky. There are sponsors who are highly abusive, but there are also sponsors who are very uh, generous and kind and, and do take care of their domestic workers and provide for them. In fact, some of these sponsors have paid for women to come back even during this period when, because there have been crises in their homes here. So uh, that's one set and of them, we don't really know very much. Uh, but the second group are the women who actually take up informal employment on an open market, which is basically part-time employment. They go, there's a large Indian expatriate community in the Middle East who's, who are not looking for full-time workers whose responsibility they want to take up. So they're basically looking for women they can get for, you know, two hours or an hour as part-time workers. Now, these workers actually live there on what are called free visas, visas that they buy because there's a lot of visa trading, which is illegal, but they are bona fide visas nevertheless. So these workers live outside in rented rooms and uh, they get higher salaries basically, but they've got to take care of all their needs. And therefore, they are really badly affected. One, they're out of employment because many of their employers also have either returned or, or are uh, not employed anymore or are having trouble. Anyway, they cannot go for work. They have to pay their rents and they're not able to come back for various reasons, because the priority list of those who want to come back, actually, uh, you know, we still haven't started getting labor migrants back, low-paying labor migrants. We still, uh, we've only got migrants who are older, ill, pregnant women, etc. So none of the women who are in lower earning occupations have actually come back to the Vande Bharat uh, mission uh, flights. Some of them whose employers have sent them back have come through chartered flights, but not these other women. Uh, you'll have to wind up we, uh, I, I'm uh, true I just want to make one more point that they are irregular the flight charges are very expensive so I really don't know how they are going to be able to negotiate this very difficult time in coming back, thank you uh, Thank you, a uh, big thank you to all our panelists for trying to uh, keep time despite the fact that we started late um, uh, there are a few questions.
um, uh, which are basically around domestic work and domestic workers um, and the issue of labor codes, uh, as well as the fact that, um, uh, uh, so the questions have come from Elena uh, in NLI, and there's Raj Shekhar, Padmaja, and Shreya Malik. Um, uh, uh, the question is, uh, to Nita and Indrani, domestic workers are recently recognized by COVID-19 labor codes by f the finance mm -hmm. minister and uh, uh, by giving 500 rupees to their accounts, mm -hmm. uh, which is also a devaluation of uh, the work they do and even the incomes that they get uh, or, or were getting normally, as well as in terms of the fact that even in, uh, today in terms of the labor market women are still seen as dependents vis-a-vis -vis the males. Uh, uh, if there's anything you would specifically like to say because otherwise I think we have just a few minutes left. Dimple, do you think we have, uh, we can give a minute to... Yes, we, we can give two, three minutes, three minutes. Okay, Four yeah. Minutes. So, uh, so uh, these questions were specifically to Nita and Indrani, but uh, we can give a minute each to all the panelists, maybe. Yeah. Yes. Nita, would you like to come in? Uh, on the question of domestic workers, the fact that they are in the COVID labor list and the, the contribution is just 500 rupees, so and they have lost employment. So this is in no way in comparison to what they were getting. It is not going to replace what, you know, kind of uh, uh, the wages that they have. And many of the domestic workers in cities, they have actually migrated because of the lack of employment and the fact that many are on rent paid and they have to pay rent. And in the absence of any income, they can't afford to pay rent and stay in the cities. In Delhi, the situation is slightly different because you have settlement of workers in terms of they are they some of them own their own small homes so there and it also but it varies across localities there are also people who are still pay have to pay rent and uh, and many of the domestic workers are also uh, you know kind of uh, into huge debt traps in the sense that they have already borrowed and then they are also now what they have to return those money and you know i think so this 500 rupees is not going to help women in domestic work, I, you know, I really don't think that is the case. Rani, you want to add something? Yeah. I just wanted to say that domestic workers are included in the Social Security Code. And it is precisely this differentiation that is made between the, uh, the their, they need regulation to give them decent wages, paid leave, maternity leave, all the conditions which make work, uh, uh, the, their paid work uh, secure, all those things. But uh, what is the policy? They are excluded from the wage code. They are excluded from the Occupational Safety and Working Conditions Code, but they are included in Social Security, in the Code on Social Security. This is the way in which they are being uh, uh, per uh, perceived. And we all know that in the Social Security Code, as far as unorganized workers are concerned, it's basically the same old social assistance programs for BPL below poverty line, which is, you see, so they are not being given the dignity of uh, or the status of a worker. They are just being given a certain uh, condition uh, uh, status as poor. And that is the way in which uh, the whole thing is framed. I just wanted to add one point and just take this opportunity to say that the fleeing of the migrants, men and women, the fleeing home that we have seen in the COVID pandemic, we can only hope that this will have the force like a general strike and at least push employers to start because they are going to have faced a certain uh, shortage of, uh, of uh, this cheap labor that they've had all this time. It may push a certain agenda as far as workers' uh, conditions are concerned. I just, one last thing is, the two major cases that have been come to light uh, 
in the recent sing one is of jamlo magdam and i wanted to just mention to nitya jamlo magdam of this village adev in chatisgarh who went to the uh, in this group to the chili fields in a minute to one minute okay i'll leave we can discuss it later nitya we can discuss it later because you know this group migration that you were talking about i would like to uh, <laughs> we talk about our experience we have lot is lot of work but thanks sir uh, yeah thanks indrani we can talk about it uh, offline i think i think one thing which i had also mentioned this jandhan accounts and so on is really a mockery of uh, women's work in terms of you know 500 rupees 500 rupees gets nothing whether in rural or urban you know it doesn't even get an lpg cylinder i mean so it's i think that uh, that we really can't compare uh, this jandhan account with any kind of a fair uh, compensation in terms of loss of work or loss of incomes and so on i think nariga is one thing but i think nariga uh, which has generated uh, employment but i think now it's a lot of that itself is also distress the very large and where women are doing nariga in addition to other kinds of work so i think we haven't been nobody has been able to go to these rural areas to really study in terms of how many hours these women have been working uh, including nariga and other work sites and i think we mustn't forget that women's bodies also i mean how much strain can they take and uh, it it is going to have a negative uh, potentially a negative impact not only for pregnant and lactating women but for all women in terms of uh, their health and i think finally the indebtedness point i think in the complete loss of assets and indebtedness and until and unless we can actually make sure that women are also equally recognized as agricultural workers as farmers give them dignity of work at home give them access to all the facilities that i think this is an opportunity to really push for that thank you uh, pravina would you like to add something Pravina? Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, just one thing. Yes, I think the government should uh, um you know recognize uh, poor women's aspirations to migrate overseas and frame policy that would protect their rights rather than preventing them from migration. Um and also that uh, one more point that over a long period of time the government's policy has has actually harmed the labor market prospects of uh, women migrant workers domestic workers in all the middle east and destinations today they are in that in the hierarchy of nationalities in the labor market very low when they started in the 1960s they were really uh, looked up to i mean they were they were the most preferred segment of migrant workers so that's all thank you oh uh, well thank you all i'm sorry for having rushed you i've just received a message that we could go on a little longer but i guess i think uh, uh, we haven't uh, um, uh, we owe firstly an, a big apology to all those who were trying to reach us and uh, i got several messages while we were uh, uh, here during the webinar saying we've been trying to link up and we couldn't etc uh so that is one thing and i think would suggest to neeta that maybe we should explore how to then now make this uh, recording uh, accessible to those who wanted to link up with us i think uh, we covered a lot of ground it's uh, unfortunate we couldn't entertain more questions and have a, a longer discussion um, but i think uh, we managed to cover both the context in which migration takes place the, not just the context in terms of the rural economy the larger uh, macro economy and the trends in terms of our growth paradigm the growth patterns that we see but we also managed to uh, lay out the context in ter the terms of the specific form and nature of women's migration how the embeddedness within the institution of the family sort of pulls them back even as they are stepping out how the stereotypes about women women's unpaid work and how unpaid work which is sort of the stereotype as well as the uh, discriminatory exclusionary aspect is taken into paid sectors of the economy or paid uh, productive work uh, which women perform which is also continuously devalued what was i think clear from uh all the presentations was that 
the uh, discriminatory uh, patterns uh, do not get erased as they move from the rural to the urban. And in fact, their concentration in the unorganized sectors, unregulated sectors uh, continues. But I think uh, more than anything else, what these presentations bring out for us is that there is so much rich, um, not just data, but also rich experience and uh, research material available to us. Much more needs to be done. Much it, these uh, we need to build on this experience, and how important it is to ensure and uh, through interventions like these and other researches, how important it is to ensure that attention is paid to the gender dimension of uh, migration altogether, of course, the specificity of women's migration. If we are to understand what is happening in terms of migration, labor migration, how it feeds into the larger macro structures, the um, uh, unequal patterns in the uh, patterns of accumulation that capitalism employs in present day. And I think what was clear was that a lot of our pa uh, panelists felt that somewhere this would not only be uh, that not only would that this would not be erased, but this may be reproduced in newer and different forms in the context of the pandemic and how the economy, uh, the course that the economy may take. I think the fact that the government and uh, not only spokespersons for the government should be. Uh, 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 their attention should be drawn, but in terms of policies, policy statements, including what Praveena was saying towards the end in terms of the international uh, dimensions of uh, women's labor migration. But what we found clearly was that in all the orders, in the circulars, in the SOPs that were uh, issued during the last three months, somehow women were just missing. Even though women were visually there, the issue of domestic work, as many of you pointed out, came out very strongly. But I think the fact that in official policy, women, women's needs, women's migration, women's uh, 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 needs, even in terms of processes of return migration, were just totally missing. And I think it's important that we look at continue to focus on this to push for uh, more debate and of course much more research and better data. Um, the um, inequalities, the persistent uh, gender stereotypes, uh, as well as the rigidities in the labor market, of course, have to be countered in many different ways, but also to ensure that women and women's uh, dimension is factored in in terms of social protection, social security policies uh, in the future also. I think the pandemic has offered us an opportunity to at least look at paradigms of development, growth, uh, economic trends from the migrants' perspective. And I think it is important that we need to factor women in much more centrally and much more crucially into this. So I would like to um, call it a day for this webinar. I think we need much more uh, discussion on these issues. A big thank you to all the panelists. We owe a real apology to all those who were wanting to listen to us, uh, our panelists, and missed this opportunity. Over to you, Dimple, to wrap up now. Yeah. Thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, particularly all the panelists who readily agreed uh, to our request uh, to join us on this uh, webinar and uh, made it a really enriching session. Uh, there have been a lot of comments that's been coming up, uh, speaking on, uh, uh, you know, how uh, we have organized this. Yes, we did have that uh, issue in the beginning of uh, not being able to live stream. Uh, but we are going to put that up on uh, YouTube. The recording of this entire uh, webinar will be up on YouTube um, uh, in the same uh, link that we have uh, provided. We really uh, apologize for this. Uh, we want to thank uh, Professor Vikas Rabha, uh, especially uh, at this juncture, uh, 
for helping us out uh, in this uh, uh, organization of this uh, webinar. Uh, we'd also like to uh, thank uh, all others, um, particularly uh, for, the, to, to, for the webinar, the posters that were being designed uh, by uh, um, I, I mean, I, I just forgot. Uh, in the granny sister. Can you please tell me? Shashwati, Shashwati, Mojumda. Shashwati. Suddenly I forgot the name. I'm sorry about that. I really want to thank Shashwati for this uh, design. I want to thank uh, Sundaresh. I want to thank everybody else who's been part of this uh, webinar. Uh, Indrani, Neeta. Uh, I want to, of course, uh, thank uh, Pramila and Nitya. Uh, and uh, and all the participants, I mean, uh, who joined us as well as who registered for this uh, program. And that's what we want to apologize that, you know, we could not live stream. We had uh, over uh, 300 registrations on that Google Forms and uh, many people are waiting and really apologize for that. Uh, we hope like we'll do more and more events uh, and with all of these uh, after streamlining all these processes. So thank you once again. Have a good Sunday.